Today we're talking about a holy home. Holy home. Hopefully everyone is trying their best to establish their own homes as godly homes. Amen. Hopefully you are instituting and practicing uh, the ways of God with your children and with your family members. But hopefully you're doing what's right there. But today we're actually going to be talking about us being a holy home for God. Amen? Because God is in us. Right? As we understand, God is actually in us. So if God therefore be in us, we need to make sure we are a righteous, holy home for Him to be in. Amen? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And our first scripture is in Matthew 26 and 61. Now this is an account of somebody saying what Jesus said. And they said, and said, this fellow, talking about Jesus, said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. Now, this temple took a long time to build. I believe it was 46 years to build the temple. Now, it's no longer there because it was destroyed as Jesus predicted. The Romans actually pushed it off of the mountain that it was on. They pushed it off. They got rid of all of the stones. They undone what took 46 years. They undid it all. And I'm not sure how long it took them to destroy it, but I'm sure it was in a matter of days or weeks. It wasn't years. And they got rid of all of it as if it never was there. And the stones are still at the bottom today. You can go and look at them and see them. I've never been there, but I hopefully one day I'll be there. But nevertheless, Jesus said, I will destroy this temple and rebuild it in three days. Now, at the time, they didn't understand what he was talking about. But what he was saying is he was, he was talking about himself because he was going to die on the cross and then resurrect in three days. But he was also, I believe, talking about us too. Because he knew that he was fixing to impart the Holy Spirit into everybody and that we would become the new temple. Amen? We would be rebuilt to be that temple of God. In Matthew 21, 13, Jesus says, My house shall be a house of prayer. He was speaking of that temple. And as he was angered at these money changers, he was flipping over tables and driving them out with a cord. Get out of here. He said, my house shall be a house of prayer. But we are now his house. Amen? So if his house back then was supposed to be a house of prayer, how much more should the new house be a house of prayer? Amen? Shouldn't we all be praying? We should. Amen. Let's look at that though. 1 Peter 2 5. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Just like that natural temple was used for sacrifices, and, and basically the whole purpose of the temple was to be able to have a connection with God. Amen? That was its purpose. To be able to cover the sin through the sacrifices, to be able to have access in our prayer life to be able to talk to God. Amen? That He could look at us as righteous. He covered us. But then when Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice, we were able to have free access at all times now. Amen? Amen. What a blessing. But He has made us that spiritual house. He says, He will come to make His home in us. Listen to this scripture. John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Now we all think about Je we all think about Jesus telling us that the Holy Spirit will come and be in us. We always think about the Holy Spirit in us, but here we see that the Father and the Son also will be in you as well. 
We don't just have the Holy Spirit. We have all three of them, the trifecta. Amen? The Trinity dwells in you. Now, I don't know about you, but that is a very sobering fact. That causes me to want to be on my best behavior, knowing that everywhere I go, I have the God of all things in me. It's not me anymore that lives. It is Him in me. Amen? I am His vessel. I am His house. I'm a mobile home. <laughs> We see mobile homes, you know, or you might see an RV or you might see a, a trailer or whatever, but people have mobile homes. We are literally His mobile home. Everywhere we go, He is with us. Amen? Amen. So I want to make sure I'm on my best behavior. Amen? I want to make sure that I'm doing what's right because He's with me. It's not that He's way up in... See, we forget that. We think He's way up in heaven and yeah, we're doing our own thing, but no, He's with you. He's in you. And this matters because everything that you do, he's doing it with, with him inside of you. So you, you're, we're having to put him through things. When we're sinning, we're putting him through it. That's why the Bible says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit that is in you. Don't grieve him because everything that we do is wrong or that is sinful. We're putting him through that emotionally. We're hurting him. You know, some things we do in secret because we don't want other, other people to see, right? We're, we're scared of what people will think about us. So we do it in secret. But if we remember, nothing you do is in secret. Right. Everything is before the eyes of the God of all things. Everything. God is in you. And if that be the case, have you become a house of prayer? Amen. As we saw that he says, my house shall be a house of prayer. Have you become that house of prayer? And I believe if you were a praying person, not just when you wake up in the morning and where you can go to bed or just when things arise, when you need to pray for some happenstance that happened, but, but when you are a house of prayer, a constant flowing of prayer. Amen. See, one thing in the temple was this uh, this place where there was incense constantly going up. They had, it, they had to keep it constantly going up. And you know what that was to signify? Prayer. Constant connection. Constantly flowing to God. And that is what we need to be doing. There are many scriptures, and we could do a whole sermon just on prayer, but just listen at this one, and I think you'll get the point. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 Pray without ceasing. Amen. What else do I got to tell you? He says it right. Pray without ceasing. That means never stopping. That's like that incense constantly flowing to heaven. A constant connection. Amen. Miss Maggie already gave a testimony that God spoke to her. You know, sometimes we think we're just talking to God and we forget to give Him a chance to speak. And I've talked about this before, but one of the most obnoxious things is to try to Try to interject something when somebody just will not shut up. They just constant flow of words out of their mouth. And you can't even say anything. Can you imagine how he feels when we're just... Blah, 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 blah. And he's like... Blah, 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 blah. He's wanting to say something, but we won't shut up. One time I was praying, and I was just praying. You know, you just get into it sometimes. And I was just talking to him over and over and over. And he just says something over the top of me. And I said, oh, thank you, Lord. But I hadn't given him a chance to, to say anything. But thankfully, he did interject because it really let me know he was there. Amen? It really let... Because when you're on a train of thought and you're saying something and then you hear something over the top of that, you know. Amen? And he may do that to you too, but we need to let him get a word in edgewise. And when you enter into prayer, don't think of it as I'm telling him something and that's it. Think of it as a conversation. Right. And he may not talk to you nine times out of ten. He may not say anything verbally. He may interject or uh, show that he heard you in other ways, but he may not say something. But on the off chance that he does or that tenth time that he does speak to you, it is worth it. And it's worth the patience. 
Every time that you go into prayer, give him time to speak. Amen? Because he just might. And it might be the thing that you need, a timely word. Amen? How beautiful it is when you get that timely word. Nevertheless, we need to make sure that we are praying without ceasing. Keep the prayers coming, folks. If God is in you, those prayers are needed. Amen? Amen. Prayers for you, prayers for your family, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, your community, and for this whole world. Your prayers are important. Because God uses those prayers. Amen? He uses the faith behind the prayers. Hopefully you have faith when you're praying. Amen? You're not just arbitrarily speaking with no thought of God ever doing anything, right? You're believing. You're having faith. You're trusting. I believe that when I pray, God is going to do something. Amen? That's why I believe there are have been many healings taking place. And many people are able to say, God healed me, you know? Here. Not just some far off country somewhere where God may still do miracles, but here in little Sour Lake, Texas, God is doing miracles. Amen? Amen. And it's not because Pastor Brandon has the magic touch. Because believe you me, I do not. It is only God here that is doing it. Amen. So we need to be praying. If God is moving and doing miracles, man, we need to pray for everything. Right? Every single thing. And when it's time for prayer requests, I mean, we ain't got to write a whole hundred page list of things that we need prayer But You know, make sure we're praying for the important things and don't keep it to yourself. There's people that need these things. Amen? Miss Sandra Hill that we prayed for this morning, I bet you God's going to do something. I'm having a feeling for that. I have faith that she's... she's we're going to see her in here. Amen. And, and she's going to say, I feel better, you know. And yeah, God may have another plan, but I'm believing for this. I'm having faith for this. His will may be for something else, but I'm believing for this. And I believe we'll see Miss Sandra Hill sit next to Miss Jennifer one day in church. Because she wants to be here. Amen? Amen? Let it be so, Father, by our faith. But on a side note, also make sure you haven't made his house a den of thieves. Right? This is the one time you really see Jesus really angry about something. He flipping over a table. I mean, we always think of Jesus, this meek and mild spirit just going around being so angelic and nice and humble. And But here we see him angered. And it's okay to have a righteous anger. He had a righteous anger. Because they were in there, the money changers, making money and profit off of these poor individuals that are coming to try to have a connection with God, remember? To, to get their prayers heard, you know, to get their sins covered. And they're making profit off of this. And he's mad. He's not having it. He's flipping these tables over. And he's driving them out with a cord or a whip. I mean, this is Jesus. He is fired up mad about it. And if he was mad about that natural temple, how much more do you think he's going to be about us doing sinful things? Not just thievery, just whatever sin you can think of. I don't want to make him mad. I don't want to even grieve him. Right? But if we're constantly and consciously thinking about God in you, you will do better. You will want to be a holy home for him. Amen? You will. Just think about whenever people come over to your house. Aren't you on your best behavior? If you're like me, I am. I want to be hospitable. I want to be nice. I want to be, you know, helpful. Hey, you want something to drink? You know, that's just my nature. When somebody comes over to my house, I want to make sure you leave feeling good. Amen? I want to make sure you feel like, man, I want to go back, you know? I want to go back over there. But we forget that we need to be that holy home for Him and He's with us at all times. Be on your best behavior at all times. As if this visitor has come from a long distance and He's in your home and you want to show Him the best hospitality. You sure wouldn't be sinning right in front of Him. Well, at least most of us wouldn't. Right? There are some others out there I can't attest to. But yes, we 
We'll be on our best behavior when we have friends and family come over our house. You know, you're on your best behavior. Be that for God every day. Your best behavior. He deserves nothing less. Now, there may be times when things slip up or things arise and you do sin, but make sure it's not habitual. Anything. No sin habitual in our lives. Amen? Nothing. Nothing. So that we can be those holy homes for Him. Amen? Acts 1.8 But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and matter of fact in you. You're going to have this power from God. Amen? Now we're not, we don't instantly become these superheroes flying around with all this power or anything but it's His power that dwells within you. Amen? Wherever you are, He is. And wherever He is, there is power. And that's whenever I, prayers are answered, like Miss Jennifer said. When prayers are answered, that's His power coming forth. Amen? Amen. And when you pray and you believe and you have faith, that's His power. Yep. And He can do anything. Yes. You know how when you're a little kid and you say, my daddy can do anything. My daddy's the best. Well, really, our daddy, the, our father, he really is the best. He really can do anything if we believe in him. Amen? We believe that he can do it. Hebrews 3, 1 through 6. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. It's a heavenly calling, folks. Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. Amen. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end, he says that we are his house. He created us. Amen. He is our creator. And we need to be holy homes for him. Amen. 1 Corinthians 3, 16-17 Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. I like how Paul admonishes us here, not just to the Corinthians, but to all of us as a reminder, don't you know that you are the temple of God? And that if you get too far out of line, God's going to destroy you. Like he's not going to play around with us. He will give us a lot of leeway and lenience, but if we keep continually defiling his temple, he's just going to take us out of the way. Now, if we're truly saved individuals, amen, we're still going to heaven. But he might cut our time short because we're not using this vessel wisely. You know, sometimes we forget that we were bought at a price. And the Bible over tells us over and over that we were purchased by his blood and that we are not our own anymore. He owns us. Amen. And he's a good master. But nevertheless, if we do not use this vessel wisely, he might just say, son or daughter, it's time to come home. And cut your time short. Let's not be that way. Let's not defile our temples. Amen? Amen. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Or do you not know? He says it again. Do you not know? Do I have to keep reminding you? You should know this by now, folks that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And as we saw in the other scripture, that not only the Holy Spirit, but the Father and the Son are with us as well. Who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. 
For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Amen. Our body and our spirit belongs to Him. Therefore glorify God in your body. Amen. Use this vessel for His glory. For His purpose. Amen. And ask yourself, what can I do for my God? Amen. And if you don't know, and you're asking with faith, He will tell you. Especially if you have become that house of prayer and you're constantly sending those prayers forth. God, show me what it is. Lead me. Guide me. Every time I get out of bed in the morning, I say, God, I want to do something for you today. Show me what it is that you want me to do. And He just with little breadcrumbs along the way, inches me along. Amen? He doesn't tell me the full picture up front because it'd blow our minds. And and all the detail would just throw us off, right? We wouldn't remember how to do every little thing. But He leads us and He guides us along the way and He shows us what we're supposed to do. Amen? Amen? But we have to be compliant. We have to be willing vessels. We have to be open open to His leading, to His moving, to His guidance. Don't be like those mules, right? Have you ever seen stubborn mule? That is a saying for a reason. Because sometimes mules can be quite stubborn, right? Don't be a stubborn vessel. Just move as he tells you to move, amen? If it's time to go forward, well, here we are, moving forward. Time to go back, go back a little bit. Time to do this or that. Just move as your master leads you, amen? 2 Corinthians 6, 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Be blessed with that statement this morning. That He is with you. He will dwell among you and walk among you. You know, I believe whenever Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, It says that God walked with them in the cool of the day. That really appeals to me as a big man because I get hot in the summertime. I'm a sweaty, nasty individual. Randy said, man, you stink yesterday. (laughs) You stink. I was like, I know. I've been working. I've been setting up stuff outside. I'm hot. I'm sweaty. She's like, it's okay. I stink too. (laughs) We get hot. We get sweaty. But you know When he says he walked with them in the cool of the day, that appealed to me because he walked at a time that would be pleasing to them. Amen. He was with them when it was good for them. Of course, he's with us at all times, but I like that he he, he purposefully walked with them in the cool of the day because it was the best time of the day, in my opinion, right? He walked with them at the, the best time, and he is with us every day. He is with us at all times. Be thankful for that this morning. Thank you, Lord. Ephesians 2, 21 through 22. In whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. I like how it says you're growing. Have you ever made improvements on your house or seen that done? Like, one of the things that me and Rindy like to watch are those home improvement shows, like adding additions on or making your home look cooler or whatever, you know? If you like that kind of thing, you know what I'm talking about. But sometimes it's born out of necessity. Some things need to be repaired or fixed. It's growing. It's a living thing almost. And that's what God does in us as well. We are constantly growing as individuals. You know that old uh, idiom... You can't teach an old dog new tricks, right? We're not dogs, thankfully. You can teach us new tricks, God. Amen. You can teach us new ways of being. You can help grow us as your home. You can make us and adjust us and uh, remodel us to your liking. Amen. Add new additions. Learn new tricks, whatever you want to call it. Figure out new ways of doing things and being better. Because at the end of the day, what we are to Him is vessels that He uses. Amen? 
Now, this might be a confusing concept, but have you ever heard of a mech before? A mech is basically a robot that you pilot, right? In a sense, we are like his mechs. We are like these flesh robots that he is inside, moving us and controlling us to where he wants us to go and what he wants us to do and what he wants us to say. Now, the mech has no choice in the matter. The mech is just a tool. And that's the main point of this. I know we've all used tools of some kind. Maybe it's a chainsaw. Maybe it's just a hammer. Maybe it's a screwdriver. But we've all used tools. And the tool has no say in how it's, how it's used. It was designed for a purpose. And the owner of that tool uses it for its purpose. And in the same way you were designed for God and His purposes. And you were designed to a complete specific tasks that only you can do. Amen? He will use his tools wisely, and we don't have to worry about any of that. We just have to be willing. Amen? Amen. But what kind of house do you want to be? We must ask that question. What house do you want to be? I want you all to go to Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Whew. Man, I love this parable. I love it so much. Who wants to be the wise man? I, I, I have a vision of this, and I've talked to you about this before, and I want it to be a painting. But... I see a man who built a castle on a rock and the ocean's there and it's beating on the rock and it's not even touching the castle because the castle is founded on the rock. And then there's another picture of this little boy on the beach looking up at this big castle and it's beautiful and he says, I want to build that castle. And he's on the beach with the sand and he uses the sand as his molding material. We've all built sand castles or at least you've seen them. You've seen your grandkids, at least, or kids, build sand castles. And he's building this big, elaborate sand castle. I mean, he's putting seashells and sticks and, you know, he's making this thing look good. And it does. It's an award winner. Amen. It's awesome. And he's proud of it. But that water comes all the same. And eventually that tide rises and it knocks that sandcastle down. And although he spent a lot of time and effort on that sandcastle, and it was beautiful, it did not stand against the waters. It did not stand against the storm. It was not able to withhold the beating because it was not founded on right things. I want to make sure that I'm the wise man who builds and founds my principles upon the ways of God and upon Jesus himself, our true rock. Amen. I want to build everything that I have. I want to make sure my holy home is built on him and on his foundation and on what he taught us in his truth, his word, his ways, his will, everything. And then when those hard times come, because I believe that's what he's saying here. He says, when the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on the house. I don't want just you to imagine as the hard things come upon you, they're beating on you. And that, it's the devil trying to tear you down. But he can't because you are built on Jesus. Amen. You were founded on Him. His ways, His word, His will, everything about you is on Him. And the devil can't do nothing. He sends everything he's got to beat on you. But he can't destroy you because you're on Him. 
and in him. And he's in you. Amen. Amen. He is in you. Two more scriptures and we'll close. Proverbs 24, verse 3. Through wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. Use wisdom today. Amen. To know how to conduct your mobile homes, your, your houses, your temples that the Lord lives in. Know how to use that wisdom and use the understanding to be established in Him and in His ways and founded on that rock. Amen? 2 Corinthians 5.1 For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. I wanted to leave that final scripture with y'all that although this outward tent is perishing, although we're, we got our boo-boos and our aches and pains and things are given out and all that, we have a place in heaven made by Him for you. You have an eternity prepared for you. Amen? But use this time wisely. I just saw something this morning. This guy said that God's currency is basically time. How he exchanges money is through time. And as we think about that, time, we, do, we can't ever get time back, can you? Right? we got an allotted amount of time, and how we use it is just how we use it. Whether it's for fruitful things or useless things, but we have a set amount of time and how we use it, what are we doing with it? And if God were to come and say, what have you done with your time? What have you done with the talents that I have given you? What have you done with that? Have you buried it in the sand? Or have you made a return on my investment? Because he's given us this allotted time or currency. What have we used that for for him? That's a question we need to ask each other and ourselves every day. What have I used my time for? Was it wisely? Or was it for fruitless and useless things? To spend it upon my pleasures or to spend it upon God and His ways. Amen? What have I done with this vessel today? And maybe you spent most of the day for yourself. Maybe you spent most of the day on fruitless things. But as you snap back to reality, focus your mind and meditate on what you can do with your time and use it wisely. Amen? As you get that perspective, make sure that you are constantly and consciously using your time wisely. It's all about priorities. What is most what is your most significant priority in life? It's to be used by him. Amen? It should be. How can I best serve my master? Amen? What can I use my body for for him? And when you think about priorities and that God is your number one priority, everything else gets behind that. Okay? Our hobbies, our wants, our desires, everything gets underneath Him and gets in its proper place. Anytime you put something above Him, things will start happening that are not good because your priorities are not right. What is a priority to you, folks? It should be Him, number one. Yeah, we're going to have our wants and our likes and the things that we like to do. Maybe a sport we like playing or, or going to. Or maybe it's family we like hanging out with. Or maybe it's fishing or whatever. But if you ever put something above Him, things are going to start going awry in your life. You make sure He's the number one place and then everything else falls into place. Amen? Amen. But isn't it cool to know that we have the Holy Spirit the Father and the Son inside of us? Do you want to be a holy vessel for Him? A holy home? A holy temple for Him? If you're like me, and you are always thinking and aware and sober of that fact, it will help you in your walk with Him. It will help you in your life. You will be more leery of how you act you will be like, man, I don't want to, 
I don't want to get out of line. I don't want to say something that's wrong or evil. I don't want to do something sinful. I don't even want to think evil. I don't even want to have a thought in my head. The Bible even says, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. I don't even want to allow a sinful thought to have a chance to root itself and to grow in my head. If I see that, oh, that's sinful, get it out. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Instantly. Constant habit of that. Anybody gardeners out there? Yeah. Gardeners? Have ever gardened or have heard of gardening? <laughs> right? You know there's a thing called weeds. And usually those weeds will hinder the growth of those good plants. So what we do is called what? Weeding. Weeding, right? Get rid of the weeds. And in the same way, the devil likes to plant little weeds in your brain that are not good. And he's trying to choke out the good word that God and good seed that God has planted in you. He wants to destroy the goodness with the weeds. So you have to be a good and attentive gardener, constantly plucking those weeds. As soon as they come up, oh, there's a weed. Get it out of here. Don't let it have chance to really root itself and to grow because it will hinder the good seeds that God has planted in you. It will hinder the good words that God has given you. Seeds of doubt, seeds of lies, seeds of evil of any kind. Don't let them take root. Hey, brother. I had an older man in the faith, you know him, Gerald. One day he told me, he said, see that plant right there? He said, would you rather deal with that or would you rather go out there and deal with that tree? Right. So it's like the longer something is allowed to grow. Right, it's exactly. It's harder to deal with. Get it while it's a baby in your brain. Get it while it's a little small plant and it won't be a, a chainsaw cut, cutting through it and later on in life. You'll be able to get it while it's young and get it out of the way and just pluck it, right? That's a little easier. You can get about four or five of them at one time. Oh, that was easy. Now my garden's good again. Now they're, now my brain is uh, growing in its proper way and ever, all the seeds are growing. and The things God has spoken over me that are good in His Word and are from other people, it's all growing good. Amen? And therefore, in turn, I am a living a righteous life as well. Amen? My brain's in the right way, which will help with your tongue, and it will help with your actions too. You get this up here, you can get it all. Amen? God knows it, and so does the devil. And they're both trying to seed your garden with either something that's good or something that's bad. Only let the things that God seeds it with take root and grow. Amen. And then you will reap the fruits of it. What a blessing. Be those godly and righteous homes that we need to be for the God of all things that is in us. The Holy Trinity. Amen. Thank you, Lord. The holy home. I hope at the end of this sermon that you will want to be those holy homes that God is calling you to be. Amen. He doesn't want to just stay in some little beat-up shack with roaches running around and rats and dog poop everywhere. He wants something cleaned up and tidy. Amen. He wants something presentable. He wants us to be that. And in our lives and in our minds and in what we say and what we do, all of it needs to be tidy and clean and fit for the God of all things. You know, in the Bible, it talks about him wanting his tabernacle and his temple to be built in a certain way. And he gave them specifications. And everything was gold and ornate and beautiful. And, every, and everything had to be in its proper place. And everything was for a purpose. And, and that is what he wants us to be as well. And, me, and more importantly, more so than those temples made with hands, he made us. Amen? He fashioned us specifically for His purposes. What will you do with that? Will you squander? Or will you try to be what He has called you to be? Amen?